Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to Lake Okwabi State Park. And our latest edition of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on this episode of Iowa Outdoors. We'll fly through the Lust Hills for a unique look at a prairie burn. Take a hike at the ecologically diverse Big Sand Mound. Take to the skies of Southern Iowa. Etch the story of a reclaimed Northeast Iowa Creek. And explore another trail in a minute. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. At its most basic, enjoying nature is as simple as finding a comfortable perch and taking in a beautiful view. To ensure that it's here for generations to come, conservation is key. Today we'll get a rare glimpse at a unique Iowa ecosystem, as well as hear the story of reclaiming a lost Iowa Creek. But first, we'll head west and fly above the flames. Fire. The mere mention of the word heightens the senses, almost always inciting fear. But when it comes to conservation, controlled or prescribed burns can be a tool that can help us rejuvenate our natural resources. In the Lus Hills, where prairie grass is plentiful, conservation officers never miss a window to administer a burn. So when the timing was just right, we decided to tag along and showcase these regenerative powers like never before. Rising above the Missouri River Valley in western Iowa, a series of rolling hills slope high over neighboring farm fields. The cluster of silty soil, known as the Lus Hills, is coated with prairie grasses. And today, this section of Lus Hills State Forest is set for a highly coordinated, controlled burning operation. Assist the Little Sioux Scout Ranch in implementing their forest stewardship plan. So they've got primarily bur oak forest with some razor ridges of dry, short grass prairie. But the plan calls for uh, maintaining those, those remnant native grass ridges and then running maintenance fires through that oak timber to try and preserve that oak forest so we can hopefully regenerate at some point in the future. In early spring, teams of fire personnel gather for annual training and real world exercises. So, so on this division we have simultaneous ignition coming from both ends and we have holding issues throughout. A mixture of fire teams, young and old, experienced and newcomers, fan out in strategic positions to safely ignite acres of Lus Hills prairie grasses. Team members use drip torches to control fire, as well as constantly monitor wind direction and velocity. Once the flames gather fuel in the form of prairie grass, the ignition can be dramatic. On some hillsides, the heat begins to create its own wind upslope, driving smoke and flames towards peaks. From a drone's eye view, you can see the Lus Hills before and after flames have reached the upper hillsides. Below at the roadside, fire teams are lighting protective burns to prevent the flames from threatening the public. Back on the hills, some fire team members are utilizing flare guns to ignite remote corners of the prairie and continue the controlled operation. The habitat is a crucial ecosystem seeking a range of benefits from controlled burns. As fire breaks down the grasses, 
the burn helps restore nutrients to the soil. It's the latest ecological chapter for the Luss Hills. After the last ice age, massive glaciers retreated from the Missouri River, leaving behind sediment along the valley. Exposed to heat and westerly winds, finely grained silt slowly piled into hillsides along what we now know as the Luss Hills. The loose soil was highly susceptible to erosion and moisture as the hills parted into signature peaks and valleys. Later, prairie grasses took root and helped stabilize the Luss Hills. The coordinated burns of 2018 are just the latest chapter. There's a plot of land along the Mississippi River south of Muscatine that's home to a variety of special ecosystems, including plants and animals like turtles and snakes that are rare or endangered in Iowa. It's called Big Sand Mound Nature Preserve, and a lot of Iowans have never heard of it. It's only open to the public once every three years, and we're giving you a glimpse of it right here on Iowa Outdoors. Iowa is known for its tall grass prairies, woodlands, and fertile black farming soil. But near Muscatine, you'll find a special place that breaks the mold. Really unique to the Midwest, especially to Iowa, because even though it's a sand prairie, and we do have other sand prairies, each sand prairie is a little bit unique, has its own uh, characteristics. This one is very much more like what you would find in the Southwest than you would find in Iowa. The mound was built by about 20,000 years ago uh, due to outwash coming from ice sheets to the north and depositing their sand and gravel and silt loads as they went. Uh, after that time period when the Ice Age ended, there was lots of water from melting surging down the Mississippi River Valley and it removed a lot of that sediment. And so by about 17,000 years ago, the Big Sand Mound was in place as a unique structure. Um, there were other sand mounds in the area and there still are other sand fields, but this is one of the biggest single mounds, I believe, uh, remaining. The sand on these dunes is deep. Core samples show sand goes down 136 feet. The company that's now Mid-American Energy acquired some of the land and made plans to build an energy plant in the late 1970s. So they had an environmental study commission throughout this area and they were astounded at what they found. They realized right away that this is a really unique, special area. Mid-American Energy set aside 420 acres for a nature preserve. Four years later, Monsanto added 90 acres of its adjacent property. And together, the two companies formed Big Sand Mound Nature Preserve. The ecosystems include upland and floodplain forest, wetlands, shallow ponds, and sand prairie. It's like a candy store for researchers and for scientists. They're so excited about it. Word spreads around and other scientists want to get in on the action because they know that what they see here is something that they don't see anywhere else in Iowa. Some of the research is aimed at animals on Iowa's endangered species list, the western hognose snake and the yellow mud turtle. It's the only place in Iowa you'll find them. The yellow mud turtle isn't actually yellow in this region. They're brown. The most interesting thing to me so far is uh, putting the transmitters on these turtles and really seeing where they go. Uh, we've got some temperature loggers out there to try to correlate uh, the soil temp, the water temp, the air temp on what stimulates the turtles either to move uh, from hibernation into the water, from the water back up to estivate, and then eventually back into the water for the summer, and then event eventually back up into the sand to uh, hibernate. What are the very important uh, habitat types or where this turtle spend in 50% of its time, 95% of its time, and how much area it, it requires to, to meet all of its ecological needs. And so knowing their behavior, when they're under the ground, when they're up, can allow us to kind of change our management pr practices and hopefully protect them even better. Back in the 1980s, researchers estimated 3,000 to 5,000 yellow mud turtles at Big Sand Mound. Now, there might only be 30. It's important to continue to do this type of monitoring to, to see and make sure that that population persists here because that's the only place we can find them. And so the daily routine is to come out, walk the fences. We walk the whole length of the fence. There's probably two kilometers of fences out here right now. 
Um, so we walk up them and look for any uh, turtles in buckets. Uh, we tend to find a lot of box turtles, not even in the traps, but just in the areas. And so we snap a picture, it records GPS off, our off of our devices. We hit a few buttons and it saves it and later sends it to a database that we're using to monitor. So. When the researchers find a new turtle, they notch a unique identifying pattern on the shell. The preserve has possibly the biggest and strongest population of ornate box turtles in the entire country. The ornate box turtle and the yellow mud turtle will spend their winters in the hill, in the sand. They go down, they dig down deep, they get below the frost line. Um, they're able to spend the winter down there and so they don't freeze. And in the spring they come up and they both emerge out of the hill. They come down into the prairie areas, except the box turtles stop and the mud turtles keep going down to the water. Western hognose snakes caught for the first time are injected with a tiny avid chip that can be scanned and used for record keeping. The buckets and traps along the fence lines sometimes catch other critters, like the sixth line race runner lizard, other snakes that call the preserve home, like the racer, and the plains pocket mouse, which is also an endangered species in Iowa. We continuously find things here that we didn't know were here, or that are only found here, or only a large population is found here. It's really enjoyable to just discover things and to see things that you don't normally see. You can't create these. So I've done much research on reconstructed, restored, and native uh, prairies and wetlands. The reconstructed and restored ones can have at least some similarity to the real ones in nature. They're not the same. Um, we can't make a fully functioning wetland, uh, the same as we have in nature, or from my, from my viewpoint, same thing with prairies. Fire and grazing were part of what shaped this and what made this the unique site that it is today. And that's part of the reason why we have the biodiversity we have here today. We can reintroduce fire. Um, we can reintroduce grazing. So then the question becomes, when do, we, when do we do that and under what conditions do we do that to benefit the broadest suite of species that are on the site and what make it unique? The harsh conditions at Big Sand Mound create a welcoming environment for plant species that are unusual for Iowa. Plants have to be able to tolerate hot, dry conditions and a low amount of nutrients. Because the ecosystem is so fragile, the preserve is only open to the public once every three years. Mid-American and Monsanto host a field day, giving people the rare opportunity to come explore the landscape, see the plants and wildlife, and learn about the research. Environmental education programs have given more than 11,000 students in Muscatine and Louisa counties a chance to visit and learn over the years. We won't be able to sustain this with our generation. We need the next generation to, to also hold that of high value and to think about how they get involved and how they sustain this. So really, really cool and really exciting to be part of those educational trips. It's just cool to learn from the scientists and find out what they're studying and to, to see them and also to see other people being excited about being outdoors and in nature. Iowa is home to some spectacular views and seeing them in person is a big part of the enjoyment. Still try as you might, some perspectives are impossible to reach. That is, unless you take a look from above. So keep your hands and feet inside the viewing area as we view Iowa by air. In the floods of 1993, water exceeded the capacity of Coralville Lakes Dam. Those waters caused a great deal of damage in the surrounding area, but at the foot of the dam, an incredible discovery was unearthed. The Devonian Fossil Gorge is an amazing time capsule of fossils dating back 375 million years, a time when Iowa was beneath the Panthalassic Ocean. Two hundred million years older than dinosaurs, scattered across the gorge floor are the fossilized remains of brachiopods, corals, and crinoids, prehistoric sea creatures whose unique designs will enrapture any visitor. From natural disaster to irreplaceable geologic treasure, the Devonian Fossil Gorge is waiting to transport you to a version of Iowa where no human ever set foot. All too often, 
when the gifts of nature are removed, they are lost forever. However, there are a few instances where we are able to reclaim our lost treasures and set right an outdoor wrong. Such is the case with a reclaimed creek in the northeast town of Dorchester. Once an Iowa City author and illustrator duo learned of all the efforts taken to restore this lost waterway, they decided it would be the perfect lesson to teach children about valuing our natural resources. I am always looking for a good story. And one morning, I opened the Cedar Rapids Gazette and I read about this man in Northeast Iowa, Mike Osterholm, who had bought a property, realized there was a buried creek on that property, and determined to restore it. And the article was at the end of that process when he had just learned that he had restored it so successfully that brook trout could live and reproduce in that creek without help. So it was a big celebration of the successful restoration. And I loved that story. From the moment I read it with my breakfast coffee, I thought, I want to write about this for kids. And I had known Claudia for years, and I knew what a wonderful illustrator she was. In fact, I had some prints of hers, and I thought, I want to write the story, and I want Claudia to illustrate it. And I don't know, Claudia, if I called you that very day, but it was quite soon after that that close. I called and said, I found this story. Are you interested? And I had the impassioned email from Jackie. And I think also when I met with you, you had that look in your eye that said, I know I am going to illustrate this book. So <laughs> I already knew Jackie's writing style and knew that the landscape would be captured and the whole story would be captured in such a beautiful way that it would be so easy to translate it to illustrations. And, and just look at it, I'm surrounding right now all these beautiful birds and hills and all the things I knew the story would be part of. I think I loved it so much, the story that is, that I didn't even think, is this going to be good for kids? It's like what I love in a story is the tension of somebody wants to do this, can they do it? Will it happen? What are the problems? Mike wanted to restore this creek and his neighbors said, you can't do that. The water will just sink into the ground. Well, Mike had already said to us, it was as if the water remembered. And that was such a wonderful quote that we just felt like we had to use it. Bringing something back that was gone, finding something that was lost, is appealing to all of us. And that notion that one person can make a huge difference is good for all of us too. Well, I knew I would love interpreting all the natural history aspects of the story, but um, the part of the story that was a, a little bit nerve-wracking to begin with that I knew would be uh, something I would have to illustrate are the big machines, but we also know that children love to look and see big machines, excavators and bulldozers, and it turns out that I was just telling Jackie she's sometimes not with me if I do a story time and there's always a children that's a bit wayward in their seats and then all of a sudden the big machines come in and their attention snaps right too. So different aspects of the book, you know, are, can be illuminated by the illustration in that way. And I have to mention one thing that I love every piece of Claudia's illustrations, but I really love how she put little bits of information on a blade of grass or on a tree trunk. And I think that's there for kids to find. It doesn't hit them over the head, <laughs> but it's there for them to find. And I, and I really love how you did that, Clay. Well, thank you.
It's very organic. You start with a very thin board that has a layer of white clay underneath and black ink on the top. You take a very sharp instrument and you scratch out what you want white and leave what you want black. It's a medium that's very sensual. You can hear it, you can see it, you can feel it. It just calls to me for some reason. Well, I think the final lines are very vibrant. They bring a lot of energy. It almost kind of glows with an energy. You know, there are lines that are created by the scritchy, scratchy marks that I make. And that's what life is, you know. If we were to walk around as scratch boards, we would see the little scritchy, scratchy marks of, you know, how we're walking and moving and being, you know, in the world. Well, I do think that children's books are a pathway to nature in some ways. If you have a good nonfiction natural history book, they're going to read that at night with you. And the next morning, they're going to say, you know, hey, let's take a walk and maybe we can find a bobcat. I mean, how perfect would that be? There was a, a playwright, Horton Foote, who said, but you don't find stories, stories find you. And I think that's the same with nature, that you may, might not know nature, but nature knows you and keeps pulling you. I would say, yes, there's, there's nothing I'd rather be doing. This is a story of stewardship, of taking care of. And anybody, anywhere, can find something to take care of. If it moves me in a way, I, my hope is that it will move children, just through the authenticity. Oh gosh, those are gorgeous. Yeah, with the story, it's there for them to, to find as well, revealed over the page turns. And I think that the creek is the same way for children. They find it. They find it themselves. It's time for IPTV's Trail in a Minute, where we show you a first-person view of a different Iowa hiking, biking, or water trail each episode. It's an opportunity to relive a previous outdoor experience or plan a future adventure. And it's a pretty cool way to view the Iowa outdoors. Take a look. For a quick hike on the southern border of Iowa, it's hard to top Nine Eagles State Park's Campground Trail. At a total of three miles out and back, the Campground Trail provides a four-foot wide rolling path, allowing visitors to take in Southern Iowa's well-known woodland curves. With a nice collection of multi-use trails, Nine Eagles afford several opportunities to carve your own path or take a shortcut home. For the most scenic route, we'll take the second fork west, headed to Lake Trail. Just as the hills start to disappear, you'll find yourself at the southern edge of Nine Eagles Lake, a perfect spot to stop and enjoy the scenery. Following the path down the edge of the lake, the woodlands last for only a few more yards before giving way to some truly beautiful tall grass. As the trail reaches its next bend, you have a decision to make. First, you could stop for a breather, maybe dip your toes in the lake, but ahead of you, is at least three more miles of the lake trail. But if you've hit your hiking sweet spot, you've reached the perfect place to turn back and head for camp. That wraps up this episode of Iowa Outdoors. We encourage you to get outside and enjoy Iowa's parks and recreational opportunities.
If you're planning any outdoors travel, check out our extensive video archive of adventures at IPTV.org slash Iowa Outdoors. And while our episodes will continue to bring you outdoor adventures over the Iowa airwaves, feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for extended features and extra content. And feel free to tag us in your online posts. Who knows, you might make it under the show. For now, we'll leave you with more images of Iowa's outdoor environments. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.